Thank you so much for joining me today. Can you give me the rundown on what you found with House Bill 199? Of course, and thanks for having me today, Melissa. Um, so here at the center, uh, you know, every year we analyze tax policy proposals at the state level. Uh, but when we sat down with House Bill 199, we were really looking at the proposal through the lens of whether tax policy was being leveraged to help Idaho and Idahoans recover um, fully from, from, the, uh, from the downturn um, and whether it would help us reach goals in terms of investing in long-term uh, economic growth strategies. Uh, so when we did our you know, overall analysis of the bill, we found uh, first that it was uh, substantial in terms of cost to revenue. Right, so this is the system um, that you know we all contribute to to pay for those core services like K through 12 schools, roads and bridges, safe communities, and so on. Uh, the price tag of the bill it would be you know in phased in in year one about 120 or, uh, or or thereabouts in the first year, and then close to 250 million dollars in the second year and thereafter. Um, so draining revenue on the scale of 250 million does pose some ongoing challenges with the revenue system. Uh, for example, uh, policymakers, business leaders, and researchers have estimated that as our population grows, um, local roads and bridges and other infrastructure require investments of around 242 million every year. Um, a similar amount uh, has been used in the past to make critical adjustments to teacher salaries so that they're competitive with surrounding states. Um, and especially as kids come back from a destabilizing year, we want those high quality instructors to help them bounce back. Um, so that is the substantial cost of the bill was uh, something that jumped out to us right away. Of course, there's other components of the bill that are really important um, for you know, everyday Idahoans to know about. Um, the um, most Idaho households wouldn't see a significant change in their tax bill from the legislation. So the top 20% of income earners in Idaho, so those households that have an income of about $103,000 and above, uh, would receive most of the benefits from this proposal. So the remaining would be spread out among uh, the 80% of Idaho households who earn less than that. So taking all of these complex components of House Bill 199 into account, reductions in the sales income and corporate rates, uh, taking away the grocery credit from our uh, tax structure, Idaho households with incomes of up to $66,000 a year would see um, a decrease in their tax responsibility that is about $30 to $90 on average, depending on a family's exact circumstances. However, the top percent uh, of earners in Idaho, so folks who earn close to $500,000 a year or more, would see a tax cut of about $4,500 on average. Um, of course, if our goal is to keep a fair tax system, uh, those provisions don't get us there. Um, and if, it, if our goal with a tax policy is to provide relief to Idahoans who are currently feeling the deep effects of the recession still, it doesn't get us there either. You know, I've had similar conversations with lawmakers over the years about this very issue. And, and their argument is, of course, lower earners are going to get less of an immediate benefit from bills like this because they pay less in taxes. Um, you know, the lowest earners pay less than 2% on income tax. And so how much of that is just the reality of how much they're paying into the system in the first place? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, through our uh, research, we have found that the tax system is actually kind of an upside down version of that. Um, so taking all the different uh, tax collection into, into account, um, modest earning families actually pay more of their income as a, as a share. Uh, to to our tax base than wealthier families. So, um, and when you say modest earning, what do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean uh, families who are sort of in the middle class income range. So, um, you know, around seventy thousand dollars or less. Got it. Got it. Yeah, you know, and let's talk about the and. Um, the overall reduction in sales tax, you know, dropping it from 6% to 3% across the board. How much would that benefit Idahoans? 
So um, my understanding of the proposal is that by taking away the grocery credit, um, policymakers intended to make up for that with a reduction in uh, the sales tax we pay on all things that we buy in the state. Um, the issue with re reducing the sales tax um, is that it's a very, very leaky uh, tax cut. So um, it would cost around on the scale of $200 million a year. Um, and about $1 of every $6 that we would give up in revenue would actually go uh, to folks who are passing through the state. So folks who are driving Yellowstone or, you know, just spend a few days in Idaho also contribute to our sales tax base. Um, so when we discuss the fiscal impact of that, um, you know, it's, it's something that, um, that is, is pretty important to, to acknowledge. Um, and a similar um, dynamic exists with a corporate tax rate cut as well. So because that's a rate that um, large corporations in Idaho pay, and because their shareholders you know, live in, in primarily outside of the state and other parts of the world, uh, around 81% of those tax benefits would actually flow uh, to folks who don't live in Idaho. Um, so for you know, a lot of shareholders, it's, it's a transaction on their, on, <laughs> on their calculation, um, but they don't necessarily um, you know, have any deeper ties to the state and, and the, the, the functions of our economy here. But wouldn't that be an added incentive for businesses to come to Idaho and invest in Idaho, regardless of where those shareholders live? Our corporate income tax uh, has long been higher than a lot of our neighboring states. So in our um, analysis of sort of what's proven to work in terms of growing the economy, um, businesses point very often to the education levels in our workforce, um, you know, how, how um, ready they are to take on jobs with, you know, increasingly complex demands. Um, and what are the other, um, the other core services that, again, can uh, contribute to producing a good environment for business. Um, so we know that Idaho, you know, uh, in national rankings does very, very well already in the low cost here of, of doing business, which includes those tax rates already. Uh, where Idaho does a little bit, uh, does, does, uh, does um, not so well is in those uh, workforce education levels and um, some of those other core services. Um, so it's 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 certainly a balance in terms of um, you know how how you use tax policies uh, to grow the economy. But from from what we know, um, particularly when it comes to other states and how they've experienced um, you know these uh, using tax rates. Um, tells also a different story. So for example, uh, Kansas enacted deep income tax cuts uh, in 2012 and 2013, uh, precisely for these reasons to attract more businesses than growth. Um, however, um, uh, the state failed to achieve those goals of boosting their uh, business formation and job creation and um, lawmakers had to roll back those tax cuts in 2018. So, um, you know, at the, the center, we believe we ought not to uh, to go down that road of, if it's going to uh, damage our revenue stream in a permanent way. So along those lines, does the Center for Fiscal Policy have an alternative proposal? So, um, yes. Um, the, one of the issues uh, with um, ta uh, tax policy proposals that are out there on the table um, is that, you know, they use sort of a short term, um, you know, revenue gains to make permanent tax cuts. Um, so at the center, um, we, um, you know, taking into account that Idahoans are still facing substantial hardship from the recession and the pandemic. Um, for example, a, a one time doubling of the grocery credit um, that comes, you know, on, on tax day 2021 might be um, a more um, equitable and, and effective way to address some of the issues that are ongoing with our economy. Um, tax policies are certainly available that are more targeted to the 80% of households that um, make uh, you know, middle or lower earnings. And they also cost less overall. So for example, Idaho, adjusting Idaho's child tax credit, which goes to families that have children in the household. Um, or Idaho could establish a credit that is based on work. Uh, for example, a state earned income tax credit and again, because these policies are aimed uh, more towards uh, middle and lower income households, they also have a lighter price tag. All right. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much, Melissa. Take care.